Prof. Hayden? Yeah, hello. Yeah, um, Sorry, Rose. Rose, can you unmute the other one? Yes, are you are you ready now, Prof? Hello, Prof. Can you hear me? Could you unmute the other Hayden Noel? Oh, okay, okay, yes, yes. Um, hold on. <laughs> I have to find the other Hayden Noel. Yes. And allow me to share my screen. Yes, um, there we go. I'm not sure. Hi, Rose, please, uh, you, you, you need to make him a co-host. Then he can be able to do that. Yes, yes, I get that, but I think there's two of him. <laughs> Hold on, um, I made the wrong one, there we go. So, um, Prof, you should be able to share, you should be able to, you should be able to share your screen now. Are you able to? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. Let me just get this thing together. So I apologize, folks. Um, I just had to drive from my house to my office because we had an internet outage in my, ho in my, uh, in my neighborhood, the whole neighborhood. Um, so before we begin, I would like to ask you a favor. Uh, there are rules of the road. One of the rules of the road for me is that as long as you're able, you're internet able, um, I would like you to, un to, to show your screen, please, to unblock your video. That way, I will see how engaged you are. I will see if you understand what I'm saying. I'll see if I'm reaching you. So I'd love to, I'd love to hear, uh, see you so that we can better communicate. Okay? So please. Okay, I see Nana and Heather and Kafri. Ka if we could see you, that would be wonderful. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. I'm seeing everyone here now. Wonderful. Okay, so let's get, uh, I'm, I'm getting, sharing my screen. So we should be ready in a minute. So I actually um, had a, a mishap where, as I said, we didn't have internet. So I'm now pulling everything together. Um, I apologize. I came into the office and there's actually almost no one here. So one second. Okay, wonderful. All right, so let's begin. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Can you see this? Rose, can you see? Yes, I can. Wonderful, wonderful. Yes. 
Okay, so, so let's move forward. Um, first of all, as I said, I'd love to see you. And this, this is about uh, the new normal uh, in the age of COVID. How do we teach? How do you interact with students? What are the challenges we should face? Um, so let me ask you a question. Um, as, as I said, challenges in switching to online. We'll also talk about engagement in the classroom. And I have this framework that I use called the three C's of online learning. Let me ask you a question. And Rose, could you allow them to go in the chat if they could? Has anyone ever heard of Mandla Masiko? Mandla Masiko. Manda, anyone, a South African? Manla Masiko. I, I can't see the chat, so I'll depend on Rose to let me know. Anyway, Mandla was a, a young <laughs> South African and he won a chance to be the first black African to go into space. He died in a motorbike crash, but he actually beat a million other contenders to go. So imagine you're Mandla and you're going to the Axe Apollo Space Academy to learn how to do this. But before you go, someone calls you and says, hey, you're going into space next week. Uh, you say, well, where's my equipment? Say, well, your clothes you have on should be fine. And then you say, well, what about training? They say, well, watch a couple of YouTube videos. You should be good. You should be great. That is how some of the instructors in our, our program here at the University of Illinois describe the switch to online learning, like going into space with no equipment and no training. So it really was a challenging move for most of them. I'm sure some of you could identify, right? And we'll talk about that as we move forward. Now, let me ask you a question. We have a poll question for you. Rose, can you post the poll question, please? And the poll question should be coming up shortly. I believe. And if my internet were not out, we'd have been, we'd have run through this 20 minutes prior. So it would have been seamless. Rose, do you have the poll question? Um, yes, I'm, I'm putting on one, just give me one minute, Hayden. Oh, okay. Sorry, I, was, I was muted. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes, um, I think everyone should see the poll now. Okay. Blended means a mix of online and face-to-face. -face. Could you select one of these options, please? Host and panelists cannot vote, so. Could folks here please vote? So click on one of these. Are you getting a chance to vote? Okay, I'm not seeing the voting. Heather, did you try to vote? Did you click, Heather? Yes, I, I did the voting. Hey, they did. I voted. Yes, okay. it's happened. Um, should I end it now? It's been yes. a minute. Okay. 
All right. Um, should I share the results? Yes, yes, I need to see it. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> this is surprising. It's interesting. 70% of students actually said they prefer in-person classes and the number is much higher for faculty. All right. Faculty, 75% of faculty prefer in-person or face-to-face. -face. Um, very few people actually chose blended. It was a small number. But interestingly enough, and I see a lot of young people here, um, younger than I am, I'm 56. So you look young to me, I apologize. But um, student numbers drop as they age and faculty numbers, <laughs> so, so, so it's the same for faculty now. So when I say student numbers drop, um, so, students, more students actually prefer um, hearing someone's mic on. Okay, thank you. More students actually prefer online classes as they age, as they go up from 20 to 25 to 30 to 35. All right. Heather, what do you think that is? Heather Beam. Why when people move from oh. high school to college, then to grad school, they start preferring online classes. The number drops. Why Heather? Maybe because online gives you more um, more of the opportunity to control your learning experience in terms of pace and mode and, and all that. So maybe as you get older, you desire more of that. That is true. The other part of that is, good job, Heather, good job. The other part of that is um, when you're controlling your environment, when you're controlling um, the experience, you actually can continue working. You can continue being married happily. <laughs> you don't have to leave your family for days and hours on end to go work on projects over the weekend at a chassis or wherever you're going. You actually control more of the environment, but you control the pace and the timing. So you're able to continue with your regular life. All right. Rose, I see someone has a hand up, but um, you can chat with them. Maybe we could take questions later on. We will in about 20 minutes or so. We will be taking questions. All right, so mm -hmm. let's continue. So, so with regard to education, COVID has had multiple impacts, this pandemic. Um, we've been going through a lot here in the US with the George Floyd protests and people have seen this, they've forgotten about COVID to some extent, but how has it impacted us? I call it three T's, tools, the equipment you need, technology, as I found out this morning with my internet outage in my home. So I, 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 I was kind of running behind and what I call therapy, therapy. 50% um, of faculty have reported that they have been sent into space without a suit and had, they had to watch a YouTube video to be trained. You know? So they weren't trained. They weren't ready, um, so they're stressed. Parents are stressed out. Some of them are now learning what it is to teach and coach their children, and the students are very stressed. So I'll touch on this briefly before I go into in making our presentations and so on and teaching more engaging and more interactive tools. As you know, there's a huge digital divide. Um, it is estimated that in some countries, especially in developing countries and, and countries like Ghana, that individuals who are poor are much less likely to have their own computer. Uh, and also if they have one, sometimes it's shared with the entire household. So that's a, that's a very distinct problem, especially for countries like Trinidad and Tobago, where I'm from, and Ghana. We also have one issue, a challenge in curriculum design. A lot of us were professors, I'm a professor myself, we were not ready, some of us, to make that transition. Some of our assignments were not tailored to the online environment. I use cases, Harvard Business School cases. And those cases require a lot of interaction. I'd be calling on Heather, on Dicko, on, on Millicent, I'd be calling on you, quick fire. 
But I can't do that using this method as well. And Deco disappeared. I don't know what happened with Deco. Deco, I want to see you. And lovely, Deco, lovely. Thank you so much. Uh, so I had to change the curriculum. I had to change the format very quickly to um, respond to COVID pandemic. Technology, internet access. Internet penetration is fairly um, high in the US, but in a lot of other countries, penetration is not as great and people have to use data packages. Okay, for instance, you know, in Ghana and, and in other African countries, there are people who cannot, they don't have um, internet where they can use their computers, they have to use their phones. So that's a challenge. Additionally, the, the inadequacy surrounding repairing um, uh, your, your tools, your computers, et cetera, and fixing things like connectivity issues. We weren't trained for that. So you, even if you're given a computer by your school or your institution, it's very difficult sometimes, right? Um, finally, therapy. I spoke to you about the stress that people in, in, you know, undergo when they are um, during this pandemic. And it's for multiple reasons. One of the things we have seen is that women actually are going through much more stress, female students than men. And I'll just touch on that briefly and move forward. Um, there's this thing called the summer, the, the summer slide. Okay, what happens during summer? Students who are doing math courses, when they come back out, in, when they leave in May and they come back later in the year, whenever there's a break, if they are doing courses that build, that are building on what they've learned, they actually have lost some of that knowledge because they haven't been practicing. Usually it ranges between 30 and 50% um, for math-based subjects and 20% for English or qualitative subjects, I should say. The numbers though tend to be uh, in this, and, and then there are people who just don't come back. The numbers and the strain and the stress placed on women though is a bit greater. Studies have shown that women are more likely to drop out of school during a time like COVID because they're forced to do other things when they're at home. All right, men do too, men do too, but women are sometimes, uh, especially uh, in the African diaspora, they are more likely to be impacted by this. So that's additional stress. <coughs> Excuse me, I don't have COVID, I just need a drink. So there are some short-term and medium to long-term solutions. I'll touch on them briefly because I need to get going with the rest of my presentation. You know, we had a delay. Um, with regard to uh, the tools, there are different things we can do. We can, of course, encourage our students to use their, their phones. All right. But some institutions are also partnering um, with businesses to loan out computers or have computers available for students who are able to come in to use them. So that is one option. The other, uh, the other thing that some um, school districts and universities are doing, we have seen it, for instance, in the US in Arkansas, 23% of households in the state of Arkansas lack internet service. So what have they done? They've partnered with a local television station, uh, a PBS affiliate, and they're providing daily television programming tied to the distance learning curriculum. So think about it. How can we, you have to be very creative. How can you actually partner with businesses, with television stations, so on, to provide some bandwidth, all right? Um, additionally, in, uh, there's this challenge, of course, of um, students who don't have and still want to use the hard copies. They want physical material. So in South Dakota, some of the school districts actually have physical drop boxes at school entrances. So students can go and pick up their homework. They can pick up printed packets and so on. There's a cost, of course, to the school, the institution, but it helps with students who don't have computers. All right, so that's, th those are, those are short-term solutions. Um, in terms of technology, instead of using Zoom, you might look at using WhatsApp, et cetera. Uh, but of course that limits some 
of the tools you can use or have in your arsenal to make it engaging. One of the things we also have looked at here is actually having students form a lot of um, WhatsApp groups where they work together and assist each other. Or we've had, we've formed um, tutoring hubs. So we ask senior students, PhD students to make themselves available to do tutoring online for students who are having uh, difficulty. So they sign up and they say, I'm able to tutor in these areas and we match them with students. All right, um, let's move on. So these are just generally some ways we can tackle the education environment with COVID. Now, let's talk about specifically about teaching online. How do I teach online? What do I do? I'll divide this into two areas. First of all, synchronous learning. There's synchronous learning and asynchronous. What's synchronous learning? What we are doing now. Asynchronous, we've recorded videos. Students go watch it online or we let them watch some YouTube videos and then come into class where we discuss ideas or we discuss assignments. So synchronous learning. When I, oh, there's Rose and Senna. Okay, there you are, you're starring. So I talk about the three C's of online learning. What are the three C's? First is communication, next connection, and finally, congratulations. Congratulations, let's go through three of them. Let's go through them. Communication, and these are essential. These are essential to being successful in the online environment. Uh, First, communication. And I, when I talk about communication, I'm talking about enhancing engagement. Enhancing engagement. Um, first of all, studies have shown that even in the online environment, energy, joy is infectious. Okay? So if you have a, if you have a wonderful smile like Hannah, and, and um, I can't, my glass off, Nutifafa, if you have that, it share it, share it. It actually, as I said, research shows it's contagious even in the online environment, all right? So if you're as studious and focused as Peter, I would say, no, you need, you need to share it. Otherwise that spreads to your students. You see Peter, Peter is feeding off of the positive energy, okay? So engagement, engagement is essential. Um, Ask questions, ask questions. I've already asked you questions during this presentation, but there are different ways to ask questions. You can ask questions either directly or you can ask questions using polling software. And I'll show you that in a minute. Here we have Dicko back with us again, Dicko. You doing okay, Dicko? Dicko's hand is still up. Dicko, thumbs up if you're doing okay. Deco isn't hearing me. I think Deco has gone again. I've lost him. Okay, ask questions. Um, I'll show you. I'll, I'll, I'll show you how to do some poll questions in a minute. Also, Zoom breakout rooms. One of the things you want to do is break up the monotony of the presentation. Right? The presentation stuff. You just can't lecture throughout. So I am going to break this up very soon into different component parts, and you'll see. Um, but you cannot just talk straight for one hour. The final thing about engagement is having a virtual office hour. It's essential to actually have, tell students you're available, but also lets them know you care. You know, one of the two components of student evaluations in terms of a faculty member's effectiveness, their knowledge and that they care. Two major components, how organized they are and so on, yes. So, so I know if you're evaluating, you say, nah, at the beginning for the first 10 minutes, this guy didn't know what he was doing. I, I didn't because I had to come to my office, rush over here. Hopefully no cops pulled me over uh, to, to be with you um, because of the outage. But you should actually host an office hour and encourage students to come reward them, reward them for coming. Give them a mag, do something, a point, whatever, uh, extra credit, but reward them, reward them. All right. So let's look at some of these breakout rooms, breakout rooms. 
breakout rooms are really useful because students actually have said when asked, uh, 90% of students, between 90 and 95% of students said they actually like to communicate with each other. I don't know who the 5% are who don't, but 95% of them actually say they, they are very, very satisfied during a session when there are breakout rooms. So you want to enhance satisfaction, you want to enhance learning. The students can teach each other. You don't have to do all the teaching. So we are going to have a sample breakout room here. Um, and here's the question. What do you think is the best way to keep students engaged in the virtual classroom? Here are the rules. Remember your breakout room number? Each person in the room needs to present one idea. As a group, you select the best idea and appoint the speaker from your group. I'm not going to ask all groups, just one or two. But I want you to see what the room is like and how it's how it's how it's used, how it's utilized. You only have five minutes for the room. I'm sorry. So you have to be brief. <laughs> you have to be brief. You have to be quick. Um, all right. We have 32 participants. About four or five of us are actually administrators. So let's do five rooms with five participants each. Rose, can you put them in breakout rooms, please? Remember the question, what's the best way to keep students engaged in the virtual classroom? Remember your breakout room number, and please come back. We only have about 20, 25 minutes, and I want to hear your questions. Go. All right. Breakout rooms now. Rose, are you putting them in breakout rooms or am I? I am adding everyone. Okay. Uh, is everyone in a room or? Nope, they're not. You actually have to click and accept the invitation to the breakout room once you're put in there. Um, assign to assign. So we'll have how many people per room, Hayden? Five. five. You might have one room with less, but five people per room. Okay. Just accept to go to your room. Network is in. I think Except everyone should be in a breakout room by now. Yeah, I'm leaving my breakout room because I am a... Uh, I was assigned, so I had to leave. Okay. Um, Um, a reminder of the question again, please, Hayden, can you share on the screen here?
We are back, Hayden. Okay. Okay, so I am going to leave that, leave that meeting there. That's fine. Okay, wonderful. Can you all hear me? Thumbs up, thumbs up if you can. Peter, Heather. Okay, wonderful. So let's start with group number two. Well, actually break out group number three. What was your best idea? Who was in breakout room number three? You were supposed to remember your breakout room number. <laughs> My students do this to me all the time. <laughs> I will just call you at random then. Senna, go for number four. Represent number four, Senna. What was your idea? Kaiser is speaking for us. Oh, Kaiser, talk to me. You're on mute. Oh, she's on mute. Could someone? Okay, now, now, now. Hello. Yes. Hi from Sweden. Uh, oh. I'm Kaisa, and in our group, we discussed various ways, but I think one way that you have used already is to use the names, then you feel seen. And it's actually an advantage we have in the online classroom compared yes. to the offline. The yes. names are just down here. So we yes. don't have to look in our brain database. We have it in front of to us. remember so to, the name. Yes, to remember, to use the names. Then we feel thing. part yes. of the lecture. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You know what throws me off as well, Kaisa, when my students sit in different locations in, in the classroom? Because, you know, when we encode information, we encode context as well as the person and the name. So the person next to whom they sit helps us remember the name. They switch around and I can't. Having the names here, you could sit wherever you want. Yes. I will remember your name. So that's, that's true. That's correct. Okay. Um, Let's see, group number one. Who was on group number one? Because if you don't have your camera on, we can't see you raise your hand or anything. Raise your hand so we could unmute you. You can raise your hand electronically, but we want to see you. Group number one, where are you? Okay, who was in group number one who wants to speak? Raise your hand or show your camera so we can see you. Hmm. All right, I'm just going to choose people. Alhassan, Sido, where were you? Which group number? Alhassan, talk to me, Alhassan. Unmute Alhassan for me, please. Okay, done. Alhassan, no, he's still, Alhassan Sido is still unmuted. He's still muted, no? Yes, I have unmuted him. He has to accept it. <laughs> Okay. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. I, I have a very poor audio right here. We can hear you. I have. I have a very. I have a very poor audio over here. So. Okay. I, hello. We can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. Honest. Well. Okay. I actually was not paying much attention at uh, when we switch over to the uh, breakout room the, the okay. breakout rooms okay I, well all right so we'll know. switch to someone else alasan yes. so pay attention next time peter, peter let's go okay. thank you so much peter yeah hello oh, everyone you. just introduced by way of introduction i'm a professor of political science at davidson college in the us but i work with a lot of professors in digital learning um in in nigeria and ghana as well so just I know out. David. Hi, everyone. So I have friends who played soccer there. You had a great soccer team when I was growing up. We, great we, we team. were very good in that area. So yeah. a couple of ideas came up in our group that were really good. Um, the first thing was uh, breaking up um, lectures. So some of us are used to lecturing for maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes or longer. Um, but breaking that up into chunks and interspersing it with uh, rich media, such as videos, short videos, maybe one minute, two minute, not really long, um, but something that students can react to, engage with as well. So that was one idea. The second one was the breaking out in groups. 
But I, I think the thing that I would add to that, in addition to breakout rooms, is having the students, you know, work in a Google Doc or some sort of collaborative document. So that yeah. way, when you come back from, you know, um, the breakout rooms, you have something very tangible that you as a professor can use to assess, for example, participation. And that was one of the things we talked about in our group that we that uh, as professors in this environment, sometimes we have to move away from the almighty exam, you know, mentality and, and assess in very uh, in different ways than maybe we're accustomed to doing. And that one of those ways is participation. Yeah, I, I like the idea of um, about breaking things up. Uh, an article in HBR by Justin Hale and Joseph Rennie talked about the five minute rule and the five minute rule, they says, don't go five minutes without engaging the students in some way, giving them a problem to solve, calling on someone to answer a question or giving them a poll or something. I, 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 am, I always say when I read these things um, that uh, there's context, right? So in a situation like this, where we have an hour, we try and get stuff in, I, I am breaking it up, but sometimes you aren't able to as quickly as five minutes, but as often as possible, as often as uh, circumstances would allow, 100% you actually should. There, there should be a between a five to eight minute rule. If you go on for 25 minutes talking, you have failed. You have failed. You have lost students by then. Look at them looking down, and you know they're not looking down at the keyboard. They're looking down at their phones. All right? So that's a great point. That's a great point. And also the point about assessment. I'll just take one more. I'll just take one more. Um, let's see who we shall take. Group number four. You're four, right? So let's do group number five. Raise your hand if you're group number five. Was that Philip? Philip, were you group number five? Could you unmute Philip? No, he was five. Philip, unmute him. Um, uh, Peter and I were in the same group, so. Oh, okay. So, yeah. All righty. Well, I don't see group number five, so we'll have to move on, but thanks. The, this was just showing you a tool that you could use um, once you're using apps like or software like Zoom. It's actually one way to be very engaging, very engaging. Now, another tool that I use, another tool that I use is, and let me get to it. Okay, uh, one second. All right, can you see this? Another tool that I use is polls. Peter, can you see this? Kaisha, okay, Philip, okay, wonderful, it's polls. And I use polls a lot for things like just icebreakers. If I'm presenting um, at a conference or presenting to you, what I would usually do if I were here on time, would be at the beginning to set up a poll saying, well, where are you from? What country are you from? Or what town are you from? And have a word cloud. So you'd enter a word and it would pop up. So I'd see where you're from. Or I might have asked you, what do you do? Are you an educator? Are you a student? Are you an administrator? And we're able just to, to engage the audience. So it also sets the tone that this is what you expect. So. If you're teaching a group of students, you can ask them what activity they engaged in over the weekend and let them enter that in on the chat, all right? As long as they keep it PG. Um, but, but you set the guidelines, you set the rules uh, regarding engagement. You also could do that in terms of um, decisions that you're making as a class, um, case discussions or reactions to cases. And finally, very importantly, knowledge checks. Knowledge checks by engaging students and asking them a question that actually tells them, you know what, I should pay attention for the rest of this class. So let's do a couple, not knowledge checks, but just a couple of quick polls. I am going to use their free polling, there's free polling software out there. Actually, I'm using one called Slido, and faculty can use it for free for classes of up to 50 people. I forget the number, but there's a certain uh, size, but you can use it you have unlimited access until July 1st because of COVID. So let me bring it up for you. You actually use your phone to control it. Okay. 
Here it is. So if you have a phone, go to your phone, slido.com, and enter that code 9541. 9541. I'll give you about 30 seconds. Slido.com, and you'll enter that code. Then select the response. How do we spell Slido, Hayden? It's right. Are you seeing it on the screen? S-L-I-D-O. S-L-I-D-O dot com. And then enter the code 9541. Are you seeing the screen, by the way? Rose, are you seeing my screen? Yes, I am. Um, okay. For me, I see the engagements slide. I don't see Oh, OK. You're not seeing the slide of screen. Oh. Ah, I see. You know why? Because I was supposed to, when you're doing a share, you actually can share different things. So that's what I have to do. Oh. Let me see how I'm going to do this. I think you may have to end this share and then and share. then start again. Share that one, yes. So, okay, stop share. Okay. All right. So I'm not seeing that because it switches. Let me see. What was the code again? So S L I D O. Nine five four one. Nine five four one. Perfect. Yeah, nine five four one. Okay, and you are not seeing this one. Right. So here's what I'm. Okay, so I'm actually going to. Can you see the results on your screen? Can you see the results on your phone? Yes. Okay, good. So 87% of you were wrong and you chose Ghana. Um, <laughs> I've had jollof rice from Nigeria and it's actually very tasty. So, so basically, I'm sorry. I guess I'll have to taste it when I get there. But this is one way using a poll, slido.com. I'm going to give you another poll. Right, let me end that one. Let's do a word cloud. Now, uh, again, 9541. All right, are you seeing it? No, not, don't enter your word, enter your word. Don't enter 9541, you're, you're already here, sorry. You're already here. So just which word comes to mind when you think of online teaching? Oh, I need to share my screen. Share my screen. All right, go ahead. Someone entered incomplete. Enter it again. Just type. One word comes to mind. Type some more. Okay, when you look at the result, wow, wait, wait, I have to go back because this result is changing now. Internet, can you see internet? You develop a word cloud and internet is the word that comes to mind most frequently from the participants, all right? And that might just be three or four, but the more people say internet, the larger it gets. Now, when I do word clouds, I don't share these word clouds during, oh, fun, wow. Ah, 
Ah is a word that comes to mind. I'm I'm shocked. Ah, fun is good. So when okay, let me show. I can show this for you. If you just un stop sharing your screen, I'll share it. I'll show it for you. Oh no, but you can see it on the on your phone. They can see it on their phone. Okay. I shared the I shared the results, right? I shared the results. Uh, uh, you can see it on your computer, on your on your phone. That is, you can see it on your phone. Okay, so fun, fun, shaking my head, Moodle. <laughs> okay, so I wouldn't share this. I would not share this with my students while they are doing it, mainly because it would uh, create some bias in the response. It creates some bias in the response, okay? So let's do one more. One more. On a scale of one to seven, where one is very unprepared and seven is very prepared, how prepared were you to teach online? Wow, okay. So people felt somewhat, oh no, 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 they weren't really prepared. A 3.9 out of seven is not good. Okay, let me show the result. So it's a 3.9, 3.9. Um, so people did not really feel prepared, or oh, 4.1 now. People did not really feel prepared, really feel prepared for this. So let me end these polls again. Slido is free, Slido is free and you can use this, but there are also other free polling software that you can use and I'd encourage you to use it because it does help, as Peter said, to break up the lesson into chunks, all right? There's this idea of chunking, which actually helps with memory. So it breaks it up into chunks, okay? Now, the other thing that you should use is a chat. We haven't used the chat yet because we have a small group and we can actually talk. And sometimes you, you always have to have a chat monitor. Why? Because the chat a lot of times devolves into side conversations that you don't want. In our large um, IMBA class, we've actually had to instruct some people about different biases because we have made sexist comments on the chat. So you actually have to have someone policing the chat. But set those guidelines and use the chat. You can ask questions in the chat. Okay, could you tell me what position you hold at your university? Could you tell me what subject matter you teach? And we can actually see it. I use it in, with case discussions. If I'm asking people questions, for instance, could you tell me what associations come to mind when you think of this brand name, let's say, all right? So the chat is very, very useful, very useful. So that was, Communication or engagement. I'll just touch briefly on connection. Um, introducing yourself is great, especially if you are now it's an early class. But if you know the people, you can actually look for things that you have in common to talk about or simply ask them what they did this past weekend. Peter said he was from Davidson. My telling Peter that, and it's, it's intentional, but it's part of me by now, I have to learn how to do this. My telling him, I know people who actually played soccer at Davidson, creates a connection. Peter looks much more relaxed than he did an hour ago, right? But I, he does, and, and even if you might not admit it, he did feel somewhat of a connection there, but find areas of commonality that you have with students, right? The people in the, uh, in the group. Peter, did that, did that help? Did it, did it make sense what I just said? Yes, good, wonderful. Wonderful. Um, connection. Something else we also do is I have a t-shirt night. So I ask people to wear a t-shirt to represent where they came from. So that also helps us connect with each other. Um, you might also ask them to wear a t-shirt from their favorite um, activity, recreational activity or sports team. Um, but choose something that would be not be too controversial and might be distracting. All right. So, so let's say if I lived and taught in London, I wouldn't ask them to wear a t-shirt with their favorite soccer team or football team, 
because football is, is, is uh, you know, someone might wear Arsenal, someone might wear Tottenham, teams that hate each other. You don't want to be distracting, right? Uh, finally, congratulations. If someone says something that's great, you have to recognize them and that encourages more participation. So I've tried to do that today, but that's something that I encourage you all to do, recognize. I actually, at the end of the semester, send out t-shirts that say Illinois Geese Business, I get it from the business school to students who have participated really well. That has become part of our institutional knowledge. So now students actually want to participate. So, hey, wow, we've come to the end. We have very little time left because we interspersed it with discussion and questions. Mm -hmm. But let's, for the short time we have, uh, any questions? Just put your hand up and we'll get to them quickly. Peter. Unmute, could you unmute Peter, yeah. please? Yes, go ahead. There we go. Yes, so um, my question is something that I've heard from a lot of professors, um, and it's been a question I've been asked and I don't know how to answer it, which is how do you deal with class sizes that are 100 plus or five, 150 plus? That's um, a you know, obviously we got our small classes of maybe 30, 40 um, for some of the upper level classes, but um, you know, a lot of, of classes at say, say University of Lagos where we were talking to professors there, they say, well, how do we engage students using all these techniques with 150 plus? So I'm curious your thoughts. That's a good question. And I want to show you a, a short video. I teach classes between 200 to 500 students, my live session, sometimes 300. Um, and here's what I do. Studies show that uh, emotion is contagious. Also, things like connection would also be contagious. So I select at the very beginning specific individuals I would like to connect with, and I spread that around from live session to live session. So I connect with different people at the beginning or during the class, because there are some people who always want to connect. Hey, me, look at me, sir, look at me. Ask me the question. You move to the other individual. That's one. So you move around. The other thing is, you know, if you show empathy, like if I say, of course, Peter, that's a great question. I really love that question. That encourages Katya to, to ask a question as well. And it makes her feel comfortable because if you ask that question, Pina, I said, what kind of dumb question is that? Turns out, well, not if I say it directly, but if my response is condescending or my response is welcoming or open, then the others feel left out. So you're not able to talk to everyone, but by sampling judiciously throughout the semester, people feel engaged. Also, asking people to communicate via the chat. So if I say, could you please list or tell me uh, the attributes associated with something, they all post in the chat. I use the chat much more. They feel like they're part of the class, especially if I say, or my assistant reads out what they've posted. So you have to sample judiciously, connect with people. I want to connect with a few. The others also feel connected and research shows that because it's contagious and also use other means, use that, uh, the chat feature, use polling much more so, use breakout rooms, use other ways to draw them in. The other thing I didn't talk about, which is important is using asynchronous methods to actually bring them in as well. So your asynchronous and synchronous um, uh, tools must be integrated. So you have to have things like discussion boards where you participate. And if someone, what I've done in the past, if someone hasn't participated much, I see, and I see they're posted online, I actually congratulate them in the live session. So they also feel like part of it. You will never reach everyone, but everyone will feel reached. Does that make, make sense, Peter? Mm -hmm. Good, good. I'll show you a short clip before we go. I know Rose wants to end the session, but mm -hmm. um, Rose? Yes, so uh, what I said was we could go to uh, 310, so that- Okay, okay uh, wonderful, wonderful. That's a wonderful question, Peter. I'll show the video before we end. You know, actually, let me try and show it now. I have it up. If I could, um, let me stop this share and I'll show you how, I, how I'm teaching a very large class. All right, give me one minute. Um, and again, that was a- uh, a great question, Peter, and I'm not 
<laughs> I really mean that too, by the way. Um, okay, here we go. This is teaching, this session had, I think, over 200 students. So let me, let me go back and share my screen. Share screen. Um, here we go. Can you see the screen? Peter, you seeing? Kachi, you seeing? Okay. I hope it shows last time we had a problem, it was a little jerky. Hello and welcome from wherever in the world you are. One thing you know by now, you realize you are not going to be able to just sit back. You got excited. Absolutely. <laughs> I do not believe in exams. It will be a collaborative event, something we do over time with others. And that's what we do in this class. I want you to put up your hands and tell me two associations from the case. Tradition comes to mind. Associated with a, a working man. Also inexpensive and very accessible. Always end my classes by saying, all of you, go out in the world and be successful. Okay, so so basically, you see that list of words on the board. I had two boards like that, and that we engaged about. I would say it was a class of two hundred plus, about uh, fifty to hundred students, seventy five students in that class directly that day. All right. Um, so find ways and means to engage multiple students uh, using the methods I discussed. That, does that answer you, Peter? Does that answer the question? Wonderful. Next question, please. Thank you. Put your hand up. Raise your hand, please, electronically. No one's asking questions. Either I was, uh, my presentation was perfect, which it was not, huh? or you didn't understand the question. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Halberg. Yes, it's Dr. Halberg, but I was um, inspired by, by the praise for Peter, so I also have a question. I was thinking sure. about all the kind of technical disruptions, people who get to unmute, uh, they disappear for a moment, their video freezes. If, if you have tips on how to deal with this, for this not to just slow down and make everything boring and if, if it happens on the sorry, if it happens on the student side or the faculty side, I mean, I think it happens on all the sides. Yeah, yeah. When it happens on the faculty side, I just roll with it. It happened today, yeah. right? It happened today. So I, I started talking about the astronaut. I didn't. I I I'd read about that astronaut some time ago, and I was I wasn't going to use it. I wanted to dive in, but I used the time while you're still fiddling with the technological issues. So I, I think we just have to be flexible um, and, and use, think on your feet. That's one thing. We also have to be empathetic with students. Mm -hmm. Students are going to face these same issues. So if we want empathy from our peers, we have to be empathetic with students. We have to allow students to um, learn about the technology, make mistakes. They were sent out into space without a suit and had and just watch a YouTube video. That's what they had to do. Watch a YouTube video about this, how to learn. And you send a long email about how, how to go about it. So we have to be empathetic. I think we just have to be um, very flexible with it and make allowances for this to happen. And when it does, I sometimes have to go back and we, we do things that we missed out on or the majority of the class missed out on. If I were teaching today in Champaign to students in Champaign, Illinois, 50% of them would not have internet. And they might not be able, they wouldn't be able to, to really enjoy the lecture on their phone. So I would redo part of it the next time. Yeah. Right? Does that answer? Yeah. Thank you very well, much. How do you pronounce your first name again? I just didn't want to pronounce it incorrectly. Yes, it's Kaisa. Also, shout outs to my former colleagues at Ashesi. 
Hi, okay. everyone. Okay. Okay, Kaiser. Hi, Kaiser. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, next. Any questions? Go ahead, Kapul. Yeah, I wanted to know. I wanted to know from you if after your online session or online classroom uh, uh, tutorials, do you allow students to get in contact with you? Probably give you a phone call and ask you some questions that they don't understand whilst we're doing the online tutorials. The, the online live sessions. Yes. No, I don't share my number with students. I did that once and received a phone call at midnight about an assignment that was due at midnight. Um, really, I did. I got that uh, call. Professor, um, where's the link to submit the assignment at my home? So I don't share my number, but I do go back to students and use the discussion board. So we interact and I always try to seek feedback on how I could improve. So I have Two things I have done. One is I, I use discussion boards to see what they don't understand, but I also have a student academic advisory board from each class that I teach. And I meet with them two to three times during the semester and ask them, what am I doing right? And what am I doing wrong? And you, you have to have tough skin to do that, right? Because we all think we are great, but we make mistakes. I make mistakes, you make mistakes. So we have to accept that. So I, I use both methods. One is more general and much more strategic and lets me know how I could change course. The other is simply if students don't understand a single concept, we use a discussion board. And I also encourage them to come to virtual office hours. I make myself available. All right. Okay, the final question. The final question. We have one more question. Any more questions? Okay, okay. Well, I think it's been an honor, I would say, for me to be part of this. Um, I, have, I have done this in multiple places over the last two months. Um, and I really am glad that you're empathetic with me because the start of this thing threw me off a lot and we had to, you know, just moving from driving from my house to here, I actually sent Rose and the others a message from my car racing over here and being set up later than planned and all of that. So I apologize, but I thank you for your patience. And I hope that you, I know you will exhibit that same empathy and patience with your students who are not used to this because that way they'll be used, they will uh, be empathetic with you. And I'll end by saying, um, again, thank you for the opportunity, but I want you to do one thing today, one thing that will enhance your chances of success in your career, that will enhance your chance of success in your class, that will enhance your chance of success in whatever endeavor you are involved in. You can connect, whatever that one thing is, connect with each other, go read an article about, about online education, Start reading a new book, pick up a hobby, do something that enhances your chance of success. And when I say pick up a hobby, we really need to have peace of mind right now. I actually started um, playing uh, computerized chess. I haven't, I haven't played chess in a long time, but I'm playing against my computer and it's really relaxing for me. But do something that will enhance your chance of success. I'm Hayden. Reach out to me on LinkedIn if you feel like, if you're so inclined. But... I want to end by saying, as I always do, I want you all, each and every one of you, to go out in the world and be successful. Ciao. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, Hayden. Bye. See you, Peter, Kaful, Philip, Kaisa. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Senna, see you later. All right, take care. So Peter, hopefully we can connect. I wanna hear some more about Davidson. Yeah, absolutely. I'll send you a note afterwards. I've got a few thoughts. I've been working on a lot of online education projects now, so we should talk. Yeah, okay, sure. wonderful, wonderful. I have, I've written. <laughs> I'll try my best, but there's a lot of amazing people here. So mm. I think. <laughs> I'll be a small nice. contributor. Nice, nice, okay. nice.
So it's already 3.30. When should we start admitting people? Do we need to do anything? It says the waiting room. There are 14 people waiting. So we might as well go live unless Rose has something she wanted us to do, say. But okay. I think for me, I'm ready, so. You're ready? Okay. Yes, and we, are, we, are, um, we are ready. Okay. Um, almost ready, um, I think. So we will admit participants in just uh, about 30 seconds. Um, and then... Okay. We will start with a video. So I'm going to start that now. Oh, okay. great. All right. And, and we're all ready for the breakout sessions as well? Yes, breakout rooms are enabled. So when the time comes, we, no, can, no. we can set it up. Takako, I'll make you a host. So when that time comes, you can help. You can okay. Um, I do not see the breakout <laughs> session thing on my, um, on my screen. Oh, I'll set that up when the time comes. Oh, okay, okay, so it'll come later, gotcha, okay. Okay, so Abigail and I can start admitting people using the participants list? Yes. Okay. And just before you do, um, once they come in, then we get started um, after the video plays, right? Yes. There's nothing like any pause and introduction or anything of the sort. No, unless you want to, oh, unless yeah, you so want to yeah, say something. You can do all the introductions. No, no. Yeah, it's, it's no problem. A meeting as soon as we start. Okay. We're well, good. I'm, okay. I'm ready. Okay. So Abigail, do you want to do the bottom of the list and then I'll start from the so top? We, so we, um, we are live streaming list. now. We're live streaming now. Okay. So we're going to start admitting people one by one. And you can actually admit them all. Look at the top of that box. It usually should, says Should we admit everyone? Ah, okay. Let be me be careful because of the other person. Okay. Um, All right. Let's go. Okay. 332. Since 2017, the Education Collaborative at Ashese has engaged a network of African universities to share and co-create innovations in university teaching and management. With a vision to collectively improve educational systems and outcomes on the African continent, our mission is to develop and grow exemplar institutions that embody values of leadership and ethics and represent the best of African higher education. Within the network, we share meaningful insights, stimulate engagement around relevant content, and empower individuals and the collective to transform themselves, their surroundings, and ultimately, the continent. Through our connections, commitments, workshops, and mentorship programs, the education collaborative models what it means to develop and deliver exemplary higher education in Africa. Join our network and build connections with educators and stakeholders across the continent.
So good afternoon, everyone, and you're very welcome. And um, my name is AC, and in a second, I will share my screen. So I presume that you can see my screen. All right. So my name is Essie Ansa, and I'll be taking you through the session. We're going to have a good conversation about preparing students for the future world of work. And um, we've all heard conversations around the new normal. What is it? And what do we need to do differently to equip our students? Um, let me spend just a few seconds telling you a little bit about myself. I wear quite a number of hats and um, the two main ones that are very relevant to what we're doing today is Access Human Capital. I have an HR firm where we recruit um, for clients across sectors, across levels in the organization. And so I get exposed to the world of work. And then also I teach at Ashesi University. And so I get to travel between those two worlds and um, help students. So just a few ground rules. Um, while we get started. Um, first one is to stay muted, um, just so that it's easier for all of us to concentrate and move along. So stay muted unless you need to speak, raise your hand either electronically or physically, in fact, to do both um, when you need to speak. Keep your contributions short, K-I-S-S, keep it short, simple or short and sweet, whichever way you choose to look at it, but bullseye, just hit the nail on the head, no dancing around. And um, if you do carry on, I will cut you off. So let me apologize in advance um, for cutting you midway through your sentence, um, if indeed you carry on a little bit. So with that said, I'm ready to roll and um, good to see all of you here. I see um, quite a number of you from different parts all over. You're very welcome. Let me start with a quick poll. Just one quick question. Um, which of the sectors on the screen, extractive industries and agriculture, manufacturing and processing, and then professional services, which of these have the most opportunities today? So I'll, I'll, I'll stop for a second and leave you to fill that out the most opportunities. Okay. Keep going, I see people filling. I have about 21 people who filled, okay, good. All right, I'll leave just 10 seconds more. All right, I see a few more coming in. Okay, I see a few more trickling in. So I have um, 29 just yeah, about. Okay. And I didn't, I didn't mention the fine for when you break the rules, when you forget to mute yourself. Um, we're going to send you a, a bill from the collaborative. Um, I could use a vacation, so a couple of thousand pounds and. Um, so please mute yourselves. Thank you. All right. So let's end the poll and let's take a look at this. So looking at, the, looking at the poll, we're asking which of these large sectors have the most opportunities. I see 62% people of people said professional services, 27% say extractive industries and agriculture, and then 12% say manufacturing and processing. Wonderful, this is really interesting and takes me exactly where I want us to go. Um, let's let's have a conversation around this, and um, let let's talk about this. You know, there's a lot in terms of the narrative on the future of work, the world of work, 
And if you think about it critically, a lot of what we see and hear and know may come from context outside of Africa. So a lot of what we may be reading may be coming from different parts of the world. And so there's a lot of value in beginning to look at our context, what fits in America, what fits in the UK, is that the same for us? So let's, let's have a more nuanced conversation around that. Most people feel that the opportunities lie in professional services. Now, I'd like to challenge all of you to begin to look at that narrative and let's begin to challenge and question what we hear and see. When we're told that we're in the fourth industrial revolution, it's um, artificial intelligence, etc. Leapfrogging is the order of the day. That is all true, very, very true. The additional truth is that on this continent, a lot of our basics are missing. There are people in communities without toilet facilities. There are people in communities where they don't have decent roads. And so we have places where there's farming, they have produce, but they can't get it to the market. And so while we leapfrog, especially with technology, it's important for us to also look at the opportunities that still abound in our context. So we need to actually stay calm and not get a lot of times I hear people talk about the future of work with fear, trepidation, and machines are going to take over the world and people will be out of jobs, et cetera. Well, when we look at our own context, uh, we should see that agriculture is heavily untapped. Technology can provide a good you know, base for building and extending the capacity um, in the agricultural sector. However, there's still a lot that needs to be done that can be done. We have a lot of land. Um, we have opportunities to actually tap into this space with technology, marketing. If you look at the global crisis right now, supply chains have been disrupted across the world. And so we have a huge opportunity to actually begin to take that back to own our own supply chains. And so when it comes to the manufacturing and production processing, I notice most people feel there are no opportunities there. That is a space for growth on this continent. It's a wonderful space for growth. Um, with COVID-19 coming in and having our, you know, the disruption in the supply chain, local manufacturing has gone up. We're making the PPEs ourselves. We're beginning to create, which is what we need to do. If we really want to leapfrog, if we really want to advance in terms of um, technology, socioeconomic well-being, then we can't buy the narrative and not look at our context. There are opportunities for our students. There are a lot of opportunities for us to do things differently, whether it's the teaching and learning, whether it's the um, student engagement, the student support, even as we prepare them for the world of work. So there's a lot that can still be done in processing. Yes, machines will be there, will be used, but there are opportunities for our students to get into these spaces. And then professional services, yes, you know, getting local solutions for a global economy that is constantly changing. Um, about a week ago, a friend contacted me and said somebody needed to have a career conversation. And this person has two master's degrees, wants to do a third one. And the only reason is because, um, oh, I can't find a job with the master's that I have. So I want to get another master's so I can, you know, be more attractive as a job candidate. So tell me, what are the spaces that are lucrative? I mean, when you think of what is lucrative, COVID-19 will tell you otherwise. You know, we're in such a disrupted mode where the norms we know, what we know and accept no longer hold water. And so as we help students with their career planning, they may come to us with a sense of, help me to figure out what the market needs. What the market needs today may change by the end of this year, may change by next year, and we may not have the markets that we're used to. So very, very important that we begin to look at our context and see that there are many opportunities for our students to still engage across sectors. 
right? So that we're not just thinking everything has to be digital, but how do we take technology and look in manufacturing, look in agriculture, right? And then take it from there. Um, as we're going along, one thing that I forgot to mention was that if you have questions, please put them in the chat box. And um, I have um, the team looking through and then we'll be picking up questions and um, comments from there. Okay. There's so many articles, there's so many sources where we are being, you know, told about the new norms of work. And so I won't belabor the point because you've seen, you've heard, you've read, you know, you have a Forbes article here, you have a survey from the World Economic Forum, you have, you know, different sources. I want to touch on three key ones, right? And so um, there's AI powered work. And so yes, artificial intelligence and um, a lot of what we're seeing right now, you know, being done around us, technology, yes. Um, that's a whole space for young people, developers, et cetera. That's something we're seeing. Now, one shift that you hardly hear us talk about is compensation. You know, compensation where for many employers, I'm an employer myself, for many employers, it's no longer about the cash that people will walk away with at the end of the month. But one new norm is looking at benefits and looking at um, allowances for data. Data was never a big feature in compensation plans for employees, but now data is. And so people, and especially as we groom young people, encouraging them to look out for compensation that will actually help them advance their work as they work from home. Um, because transportation may not be your biggest need right now if you're working from home. And um, one of the other things that we see is clients are spoilt for choice, especially where professional services are concerned. And even, you know, with um, the FMCGs, so you might be producing. And um, as you produce, you have people in different parts um, of the country, of the world, putting their products online, Instagram, and pitching their services. And so clients are really spoiled for choice. And so one of the things we're going to see is the businesses that are responsive, the businesses who hire people with a business development um, orientation, those are the businesses that are going to really survive. And um, the three key things I want us to take from this conversation is one, working from home. A lot of times when we talk about working from home, we think of um, regular you know, workers, especially women who are primary caregivers in many cases at home. And so juggling the baby, getting meals ready and um, being able to sit and focus. One new norm is preparing our students to learn how to work from home because they also have responsibilities. You're sitting at home with, let's say, a family where your mom or your dad feels that working is actually moving around, carrying things, and they don't see you. They just see you sitting behind the computer, the same place where they see you playing games. And so the value of involving family in the work conversation is something that we haven't talked about enough, but something we need to start doing. Getting the family involved in work arrangements and getting the family to understand that I might be sitting behind my machine, I'm alone, and I haven't gone out to work physically, but I'm working. And so errands, because young people have bosses at home and bosses at work. There are errands that have to be run. Um, there are things that need to be done for the family, but we have to support them in navigating this new terrain and we need to involve families. And then the second one is outsourcing versus building versatile, agile workforces so that I may not hire new people to come in because I have staff or I have employees who are very versatile and very agile. They can do multiple things. Later on, we'll talk about being multi-skilled versus the old focus on being multitaskers. Now there's a big difference. And then the last thing that we haven't talked about enough when it comes to the world of work and the new norm 
is that we're in a trust-based economy. It's always been a trust-based economy. However, right now we're in a system where you're sitting at home, you have an audience that is your computer and maybe family members and that's it, your boss is not there. And so ethics, integrity, personal discipline, these become even more important because without it, the work will never get done. And so as we think of the new world of work, the future of work, and we think of technology, let's think of some practical things that as educators, we need to support our students to be able to do. So who they are, what they can do, and then being able to manage the family context. And um, I have a few tools that I have on the screen. And um, this is just one way where a mechanism through which employers can track and see what is going on as you work. But at the end of the day, your personal honor code, ethics, um, that's what will begin to get people to be productive even though they are their home. All right, so I'm gonna pause for a second and see if there are any questions, initial questions, comments, reactions, and um, I'll take a couple of them. If I have, I see the, okay. I think they can, you, you can press the yes button if you have a question or comment, and then we can unmute you. Wonderful. And then you can also raise your hand electronically um, so we can see you. Okay. So my aim is um, to get us started by thinking differently about the new world of work and then getting into sessions to now get into it. What has that got to do with us? The world is changing. Technology is taking over. There's still a lot of opportunities for our students. And um, there are areas we haven't talked about enough, working from home and managing family. And so with that as a backdrop, what I'd like us to do is to get into three rooms and have a conversation. So we're going to answer these questions and then get one person who will give us the feedback once we reconvene. And first question is, how can we foster hands-on experiential learning when students are not on site? It's easy to do that in class, especially for the more technical subjects, engineering, for example. So how do we foster this? How do we get this going, even though they are not you know, in a workshop on campus or in a lab? And then the second one, room two, how can faculty and administrators engage each other better for interdisciplinary and cross-functional learning? And the ultimate goal is to support students better. So instead of having silos where faculty has the faculty meeting, administrators have the staff meeting, and um, we have separate conversations going on. How can these two partners begin to have more conversations to support students better? And then the last one, and this really is the working from home. How can we equip our students to work from home and manage work and family life? Um, a lot of times we think of managing the home along with work and we think of, you know, adult um, working professionals, but let's think of students who are either getting into the workforce as interns, as volunteers, as, you know, early career um, employees. So I'm going to pause and um, between Takako and Rose and all the other wonderful folks supporting this. We're going to go into three rooms. You have 15 minutes to have a conversation. Um, and let's see your top three ideas that you can come up with. And then we'll have a broad conversation after. Sounds great. Thank you. So you should okay. receive um, some direction in a bit. Yes. You should. Okay. So breakout okay, one, so one and two are going. Breakout three, I have just added. 
Yes. Great. Everyone be in a room now. All right. So everybody should be in a room. Okay. I see the shifting. Good. Wonderful. I'll take it that this is an accidental scratch on my screen. <laughs> Rose. Uh, all right. Um, I'd like to step into some of the rooms. I know that's possible. Okay, I, I can assign you to room one, and then I'll assign you to room two, and then I'll Thank assign you. you to room three. Wonderful. Thank you. And I think my
if you're watching uh, the live stream, the breakout rooms will end soon and then uh, we'll begin again. Wonderful. So you're very welcome. Welcome back. And um, let me start with the first group, the group that started the conversation on how we can foster hands-on experiential learning when students are not on site. Who was designated as your spokesperson? The participants in the first room, are you in? Okay, I think they're now joining, yeah. All right, we can start with the second group. So while we wait for the first group to come in, um, those who focused on faculty and um, administrators supporting students. Okay. <clears throat> Who was designated to speak and share the things that you discussed? All right, I'm looking. All right, right. 
please um, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. We're struggling to unmute ourselves. <laughs> All right, so um, to start the conversation, we talked about how schools can enhance or foster experiential learning whilst students are off-site. Um, we had a few fantastic ideas from the team. The first um, contribution we had was that coming from a business perspective, where normally in business, there are simulation games that enable learners to have a good experience of something they are talking about in real life, but then it is not hands-on. So um, we talked about the fact that we can use simulation games and okay. we know there are a couple of them on the market that can enhance experiential learning. Okay, I'm going to ask, um, right, I'm going to ask that you speed up and go just straight bullseye, straight okay. to the point so we can. Okay, okay. And then we also talked about um, the fact that it would depend on what your learning goals are. So your learning goals are basically going to inform what sort of um, instruction you are going to take for whatever learning experience you are given. And then we also talked about students visiting organizations that have materials or tools that can enable learners to have some sort of experiment or experiential learning. And then we also mentioned that we can allow students to visit the site in batches. So if a school, for instance, has a science lab, but because school is not in session and they want to do some sort of experiment, we can organize the students to come to the site in groups so that we can avoid the large numbers coming together. I think okay. those were the highlights from and All in right. addition to that, there was professional coaching online and then okay. professional assignment of project. As well. Okay. All right. So I have simulations. Thank you very much. Simulations and um, a review of learning goals and then doing site visits. Thank you. So the first group, who's going to share what you came up with? And this was, um, I'm not sure who was designated in that group. was in that group? Let's see by hand. <laughs> All right, I'm going to ask Rose and Takako to look out for those who are in that room so we can get the feedback. And then let's talk about the third option, how we equip students to manage working from home. Um, who's speaking, who's sharing your top three, just your top three um, points. I can share for group three. Okay, thank you. So top three points is first, um, teaching student clear time management skills, effective time management skills, and mm -hmm. helping them with structures such as deadlines in order to help them get in control of their time. And then second, clear communication with the family about um, space needs, both time-wise and physical and environment-wise, and setting up that environment so that you're in that mindset of being at work, even dressing up for that as well. And then the last one is support in terms of academic advising, even if there's not face-to-face -face -face interactions, um, being still reaching out to them, following up, providing counseling, and even training parents in how to support their mm -hmm. students. Wonderful, thank you. All right, um, any feedback from the first group? Anything that you talked about? All right, so I'm anticipating. Okay, I see a hand up. Okay. And, um... okay, so we were actually the first group. So I think we have- So it's the second group. About funding. Yeah. Okay. And who was designated as your spokesperson to give us a quick rundown? I actually don't see some of those folks here. Okay. Mm. Rose, were you about to speak? Yeah, I was actually about to ask, um, Abigail, were you in the second group? Abigail was in group three. Okay. No, okay. yes, I was in the first group. 
All right. Oh, okay. I thought you were okay. <laughs> That's okay. Um, what we'll do in the interest of time is we're going to cover all these anyway. And um, so we're going to we're going to move on. Uh, I guess the first discovery for today is that people can get missing online. It's possible. <laughs> okay. So let's let's cover some of these. I think these are the conversations that we're not having enough of. And so um, let's let's have a conversation around these. Thanks for what you've shared. Time management, helping students with, you know, learning how to adjust and manage, you know, family responsibilities, etc. Now let's walk through this very quickly. I have only three slides. And um, one of the key things is head knowledge, what students know. So how we prepare them, we really need to start looking at what students are coming into the workplace with. The days of straight jacket, I studied accounting, I'm here to do accounting, those days are long gone. And so helping students to connect the dots, how do you do that? Beginning to have joint meetings, where it's not just faculty have a platform, administrators have a platform, but um, beginning those conversations together and in the classroom, helping to connect dots. So for example, I may be teaching organizational behavior, Takako's teaching marketing and Rose is teaching e-commerce. Can we have one project that all the students can work on? That way they are learning you know, and we're beginning to expose them to agile thinking and learning and processing. When they get into the workplace, they'll add a lot more value than the person who comes in with just one skill set. And so in order to expose them, joint projects, getting, you know, faculty to talk to each other, to sit in each other's classes and begin to break down the silos between departments. That's very important. And then also um, in terms of assessments, I'm sure that question may have come up um, in some of your conversations um, from the earlier sessions today. In terms of assessment, one of the things that Ashesi has been doing and um, to build critical thinking skills is assessments that giving assessments that do not require, you know, just the factual information that, that feeds roots learning but creating opportunities for students to use their personal reflections. And so you built this tool, you built this app in your assessment, do a reflection of the process. What did you learn? What did you learn that came from um, other classes that you've taken? And let's get them to begin connecting the dots. And uh, what can administrators do? And the key words here are synergy and agility. Right, so we're looking at agile learners. We're looking at synergy across disciplines. And we're gonna send the slide to you so you don't have to, I'm just gonna be touching on a few highlights for each slide. Engaging people in industry. And I think that's come up and um, beginning to expose students a lot more to what's going on in the field. And with all the virtual engagement, you can have videos, you know, even if they are not physically visiting a site a video of a floor manager who's walking through the production floor explaining what is going on. This also becomes a little more affordable because you don't have to get a bus that will take all the students there. The logistic needs are handled and um, you can actually engage. And um, career services and all the various student support units in our institutions can get students involved as researchers in their own work. And so on Ashesi campus, for example, if we need to redesign physical space, we grab students and say, hey, here's a project, you do the design. Um, software apps that will be needed, you know, in this new space where we find ourselves, get the students to do it, get the students to build. And then also thinking of library resources, online collections, and um, beginning to put more information together for students because we're looking for people who are learning broadly, who are looking across disciplines. And um, one of the things we need to do is to teach students to be open to learning. I have um, a lot of students who will focus on their core subjects. And when it comes to current affairs, business news from around the world, global happenings may not be as interested, but this is the time to expand knowledge base of our students. 
All right. And um, second thing, what do we do in terms of supporting students? What are the adjustments we need to make in this new era? This is a trust-based economy. It's always been, but even more so now. As an employer, you're sitting in one place, your employees are elsewhere. You don't know who's working, whether they are working well, except for the use of technology, tracking who's doing what. But this is where trust is important. The new workplace, the new work arrangement requires and needs people who are ethical. In this morning's session, I heard um, some of the panelists talk about the, the conundrum and the challenge of monitoring students doing assessments. This is where the ANA code is important. This is where personal discipline, ethics, these become very important. So a few key points. If you're a faculty member, what do you do? Ethical posture in class as part of what you do. Very, very important. We're already doing these, but be more intentional. And then using more project management tools and opportunities so that they're used to learning to juggle multiple pieces, which is what they'll be doing in the workplace. And so if you wanna prepare them, more projects, individual projects, team projects, and exposure to multiple tools that they use. Now, one interesting thing that many may not have thought about is really stepping up sports and activities that help students to build personal discipline. And this may not be something that we will think of readily, however, is extremely important. Where you're in a world where things are fluid, you're home, your mom needs you to work, um, a cousin needs you there, your boss is waiting for the report, there's work to be done. Juggling that, that personal discipline, perhaps this is a great time to actually begin to help students to build their own personal discipline through sporting activities, through projects, like I mentioned. And one of the most effective ways of doing this is letting the students own it. And so building apps to track fitness, yes, they exist already, but then this becomes a tool that helps them to learn how to, you know, not just take a project management class, but to learn how to work, uh, managing time, budget, stakeholders, et cetera, in creating results. And um, I think one of the groups mentioned personal structure, routines, et cetera, and also helping them to negotiate as they go out into the world of work, to look beyond the cash, to look out for things like data, online subscriptions to tools that will help them in their growth and um, begin to look for opportunities that help them in this new arrangement. And um, it was good to listen to the group that talked about parents. Parents may have been left out of um, the conversation for a long time. If you're a parent who has recently come to appreciate the value, of, um, the value of primary school teachers especially. Let me see you by hand. Raise your hand and let's see. If now you realize, wow, this is a lot of work. Homeschooling is no joke. Okay, <laughs> I see some hands going up. It is no joke for younger children, right? And um, unfortunately, we've left parents out of the conversation for a long time. And so it's really important that we begin to have those conversations that say, if we're having career day, can we engage, can we engage um, parents? If a student is going to do an internship, can we engage families and let them know that, you know, in this new dispensation, we have somebody who might be home and needs that space, the structure, and um, it is work. Is it possible to have the students do presentations at home to family members to tell them what they've been doing just so that they realize, I mean, you may be home, but it's work and it's serious work. And um, lastly, like I said, this is, these are highlights to send you the slides. For subjects like engineering, you need to teach, let's say, hydraulics. How do you do that? They are not there. They are not in the lab with you. How do you do that? Um, there's value in getting our students to begin to invest in, let's say, and of course there's the issue of equity, affordability, et cetera, that we'll have to address. But getting students to be able to create with tools around them. There are a number of TED Talks that are really useful 
if you follow some of the work by Arvind Gupta and um, a few other folks who have TED talks on how to use local material, um, this could be an opportunity for us getting students to actually create using what they have around them. If you need to teach hydraulics and they're not in the lab, can you help them with simulations at home in a bathtub, using tubes, using whatever? Um, it may be easier in some disciplines than others, but the more we are able to get them to do hands-on work at home, the better it will be for them when they get into the world of work. And a shift is necessary from multitasking to multi-skilling. As an employer, I'd prefer a worker or an employee who's able to do multiple things, who has multiple skills, even if they're working on one task, because I need them to draw on that. So the interdisciplinary um, approach and teaching them about virtual engagement. So beginning, one, one thing we can try is to get student organizations on our campuses to run like organizations, you know, where they have an annual general meeting, where they can showcase what they're doing, and let's create a stock market of sorts where we can look at what they're doing, get them to simulate what's happening in the world of work um, so that their transition into that world becomes a lot, a lot easier. Um, I think I have gone through the most important things that I wanted us to talk about. Let me pause and hear your views, your thoughts, your questions as well um, as we wrap up and we'll wrap up with that. So if you have a question, you may type it in the chat window or you may um, raise your hand physically or electronically, either way is fine. And um, let's hear you. Okay, let me see. Yes, Nutifafa, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the session. Uh, I want to take you back to the beginning of your, your workshop where you spoke about a student who has three, uh, two masters mm -hmm. and still wanted to go and do a third one because of, uh, according to the student, the job okay. market. So what, what do you think is the issue here? Is it the educational system or it is, uh, uh, how we we train these students not to uh, self believe in themselves because I think with two masters already, unless they are in the same area, you are already multi uh, a disciplinary person, so you could work mm -hmm. uh, anywhere you may want. But what okay. what will be the attitude going forward? So this happens to this is a mindset challenge, and how we prepare students through our career services, etc is to help them to take their interest, take your interest and learn how to monetize it, learn how to use it um, to add value wherever you are so that you're not going into a job role because of the market. If you look at the market, disruptive events like COVID-19 will throw it out of the way and you have the degree, but then there's little you can do with it. And because your interest and your passion are not in there, it's hard for you to even figure out how to transfer the skills and be able to use it differently, right? So I think it's a mindset shift that we need to begin to um, introduce our students to. Yeah. Thanks for your question. All right, anyone else? Mohammed has his hand Mohammed, up. yes, please go ahead. All right, we need to unmute you first, or if you can unmute yourself. Okay, I'm sorry. Apologies, I experienced the power outage here during our group session. Sorry, uh, but uh, it's important. I just want to share an experience. Uh, my wife runs a school, and during the the lock lockdown, when the schools were closed down, we're contemplating what kind of technology could we leverage to do e-learning while they were at home. Now, the challenge here was the, 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 the demography of the, 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 the parents that we are looking at in terms of uh, their technological capability. And this, uh, this is a busy school. And we couldn't do Google Classroom because most of them didn't have smartphones. They didn't have access to internet. 
Uh, I'm all. going to interrupt you um, and ask that you give us the bullseye straight to the um, point summary of what you're saying. Thank you so much. Yeah. So the, the, chal the challenge here is the, uh, if you are talking about parents supporting uh, their wards and, and his, his children at home, uh, there's a, maybe a challenge in terms of the, the, the level of education of the people, uh, the te their technological mm -hmm. capability. The cap mm -hmm. capability. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the challenges that we, 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 we saw. And also, if you look at the remote area, power is a challenge. Most people couldn't mm -hmm. access electricity during the process because of power situations, you know. So those are contextual issues that we have to address and find solutions to them. We mm -hmm. have to look at and then find solutions to them. How do we bring all those people who will be left out on board during the term when they, they are at home and they have to participate in, in lectures. And okay, all right, <laughs> thank you. Um, it's 4.32, we've stolen two extra minutes. Um, is there any other comment, burning comment somebody would, would like to share? There's the context we have to pay attention to, so electricity, etc. cetera, yes. Um, I think John has his hand up, John Kunene. John, yes. Yeah, Yes, I, I think that... Please go ahead. Okay, I think there's one aspect that we are leaving out, the aspect of the packaging of the curriculum. The, the, the packaging of the curriculum, because the curriculum that we are having, it does not, does not you know, allow our learners to work on their own. Like in my mm -hmm. country, we find that the curriculum is sort of like too much teacher-centered. So when we try to, to, to encourage learners to work on their own, there is that disparity between the curriculum packaging and the practice. So I think there is a need to shift uh, the way we've packaged uh, our mm. curriculum, the curriculum development. I think that is uh, very important. Okay, thank you very much. Um, all right, so on that note, unless there's any burning comment, all right. So in essence, I see screen fatigue. I see a comment coming in here, screen fatigue that we're all struggling with. I mean, it's, it drives me crazy <laughs> um, as well. And so restructuring lessons, et cetera. Okay, that's important. And in essence, all we're saying is to, to sum up, context matters. So as we hear the narrative about the new world of work, we should actually appreciate the fact that we have so many challenges, meaning we have so many opportunities. And so when we think of opportunities for our students, not to only think of professional services, we still have opportunities in agriculture, in manufacturing and processing, where we need you know, young people in there helping with branding, helping with different things. And so let's not get carried away and despondent because of the change we see and the fear of machines taking over the world. That's one. So context matters. Two, the world of work has changed. And so as we look at those changes, the technology, let's work our way backwards and begin to equip our students to be able to work in a trust economy. It's a trust-based economy where um, you're sitting behind your machine, there's nobody there. And so integrity, ethics, personal work ethic, ethos, everything becomes very important. So in our preparation, we need to look at those soft skills. We need to look at those, you know, foundational um, attitudes, etc., to help our students with. And then lastly, we need to broaden the conversation and remember we're working in an ecosystem. And so synergy, agility, being able to train students such that they are not just multitaskers, but they are multi-skilled people, professionals, who can get into the world of work and be able to fit in multiple contexts and add value wherever they find themselves. And um, as we do this, we need to engage multiple stakeholders as well families. We've never had to have conversations about work with families in the same way, but this is the time. Um, important to do that as well. So um, this has been a useful conversation. 
And um, I hope that even though most people have been quiet, you've been able to pick up a few practical things that you can do with your student organizations, faculty and administrators working together and um, being able to support our students so that they don't get stunned when they get into the, this new arrangement of work, but then um, equipping them so that they can succeed. And so on that note, I'd say thank you very, very much. If you have any questions that come up or you want to engage with anybody who's been on this call, um, the organizers you know, have your information, you can reach out and then we can carry on with the conversation beyond this session. So thank you very much for um, your contributions and um, look forward to engaging with you in different platforms as well. So thank you. Thank you, Isi. All right, thank you, Rose. Thank you very much. Thank you, bye.